Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. My name is Laura Gillis, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar. Today's webinar is a rebroadcast of Emergency Solutions Grant Program, an introductory overview. Our presenters today are all HUD representatives. Anna Leva is the Director of HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, or SNAP. She oversees the Continuum of Care Programs, the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, BRAC, and Title V Programs. Also with us today is Michael Rowenhouse. He's the Director of the Program Coordination and Analysis Division within the SNAPS office. He, direct, he directs the ESG program, helps manage the HPRP program, and oversees policy on the homeless elements of the Consolidated Plan, Homeless Management Information System, and the Point in Time and Housing Inventory Counts. Susan Zip is also with us from HUD's Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Team Lead, and she is now transitioning to take on the ESG Team Lead role as well at SNAPS. We have two resource advisors who will be handling your questions today. Brett Gagnon has been instrumental in providing assistance in the development of the regulations in support of the HEARTH Act, and Teresa Silla is a senior analyst at APT Associates and has provided technical assistance under HUD's Community Development Technical Assistance Program for the Home, Neighborhood Stabilization Program, and Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program. A few logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last approximately one and a half hours, and it's being recorded. That recording will be posted on the HUD HRE website after November 28th. A brief feedback survey will be sent to you in the email that you use when you registered for today's webinar. So please respond to the brief satisfaction survey as it really does help us to improve future webinars. We have almost a uh, thousand participants registered for today, well over a thousand participants registered for today for today's webinar. And so all attendee lines will be muted. Um, if you have any difficulty seeing the presentation or hearing the audio, First, try logging off and logging in again. If the problem persists, please use the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right of your screen. Click in the dialog box of the questions pane to request technical support. On Tuesday, when this uh, webinar was broadcast the first time, people were having difficulties with their audio reception. We recommend you use a telephone instead of your computer speakers if possible. Your questions are important to us. However, the resource advisors may not have time to answer all of them during this 90-minute webinar. Um, they also will not be able to answer complex policy questions or resolve detailed issues. If you could keep your questions to technical issues about the webinar or request for clarification about something the presenter has said, we would appreciate it. Next slide, please. If you do have a question that's not answered during the webinar today, you can submit it to the um, HUD's virtual help desk on HUD HRE and just select Emergency Solution Grants and then whatever subtopic underneath that is appropriate for your question. Next slide, please. So the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act of 2009, the HEARTH Act, amended the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. Among other things, the HEARTH Act revised the Emergency Shelter Grants Program and renamed the program the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. From this point forward, the initials ESG will stand for the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. Whenever we refer to the program as it existed before publication of the revised regulations, we will spell out Emergency Shelter Grants Program. The Homelessness Resource Exchange will maintain separate information about the original Emergency Shelter and the amended Emergency Solutions Grants Program. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is billed as an overview webinar, and that is exactly what it is. It will not provide details. Instead, it's designed to get you up to speed 
on the kinds of activities you will be able to undertake and give you the big picture of how the program will work. You won't be able to develop your program based on this webinar. You'll need to review the regulation and other HUD guidance to successfully operate your program. We can tell you in advance that you will be left with lots of questions. Answers will be available through the resources to be posted on the HRE and through the upcoming webinars that are listed at the end of this presentation. If you're unable to find information using these resources, please submit your questions to the virtual help desk on the HRE. Next slide. Given that there is a lot to learn about the new ESG regulation and there's a limit to what can realistically be conveyed in a 90-minute webinar, today's webinar has three major objectives. First, we want you to be able to describe ESG's components, activities, and basic program requirements. Much of today's session is geared towards helping you understand what the components are and what activities can be undertaken under each one. We also want you to have a sense of the broad program requirements that you will need to think about and plan for. Second, we want you to be able to locate additional ESG-related information and tools on the HRE. We know there will be many questions at the end of this webinar. We want to be sure you know where to go for additional information and what to expect in terms of future webinars. Finally. We want you to be able to list major actions needed and questions to answer as you begin to implement ESG locally. It can be daunting to figure out where to start the process of designing a new program. We want you to leave this session with some ideas about next steps you can take to move forward with your new ESG program. So, next slide please. Here's how we'll accomplish these objectives. First, discuss briefly the priorities that HUD had in mind in developing this regulation and where things stand in the process of developing and finalizing all the regulations relevant to implementing your new ESG program. We want to provide a high-level overview of the program components and eligible activities. Our third objective is to summarize some of the key program requirements provide ideas about next steps communities should take to implement their programs, and finally, identify resources that will help you design and implement your programs. Poll questions will be asked during this webinar to get your feedback on how the information is all presented, and your responses help give us a feel for how the information is flowing to you. To frame the context for implementing the new ESG regulation, and fill you in on HUD's priorities for the program. We will now turn this presentation over to Anna Leva. Thank you so much, Laura, and welcome to all of you who are uh, participating in today's webinar. We know that you have been waiting and waiting for the new regulations to, uh, to start coming out, and we're pleased to have released earlier this week uh, the first three sets of rules to implement the HARP Act. Today's webinar focuses on one of those rules, the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. As you will see in this training and in the rule itself, uh, the content really reflects our priority to fund proven cost-effective cost strategies to move people out of homelessness, as well as addressing all of the statutory requirements we had through the HEARTH Act. The other important thing to remember is that we really did try to incorporate lessons learned from both the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program as well as from the Emergency Shelter Grants Program. However, we do have a different statutory framework for the, e the new ESG program, so the programs are not exactly the same. So don't assume that if you could do something under HPRP or the Emergency Shelter Grants Program that you can automatically do it under the new Emergency Solutions Grants Program. Next slide, please. In terms of our priorities, we really wanted to uh, focus on achieving several key items. The first is to provide additional tools to communities by broadening the activities available to help people who are on the street and offering a more flexible prevention services uh, component to avert homelessness. As many of you know, 
the old emergency shelter grant prevention program was not particularly widely used. I think only about 7% of the money uh, nationally was used for homelessness prevention under the emergency shelter grant program. And that was really due to the restrictive nature of the, of the original statute. We also wanted to emphasize rapid, the rapid rehousing model, which has really been proven to be both effective in terms of performance and outcomes for those who are being served, as well as cost effective. It is also a priority of Secretary Donovan, and it is a priority that's articulated within Opening Doors, the Federal Strategic Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness. We also wanted to focus on permanent housing solutions and the supports necessary to achieve stability for people being served through this program. This is really one of the big benefits of moving from a program that was called the Emergency Shelter Grants Program to the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. Next slide, please. We also sought, while we were developing the ESG program rules, to the extent possible we wanted to align with other HUD programs, especially those programs that are the other formula programs within the Office of Community Planning and Development, such as the CDBG program and the HOME program. We also looked to the Housing Choice Voucher program and tried to align with them where possible. But more importantly, ESG is linked and aligned to the other McKinney-Vento programs. So communities can really use these funds in conjunction with each other. So ESG funds, continuum of care funds, rural housing stability funds can really be used in conjunction uh, with each other in a way that we've never had before. Also, the ESG programs are now, for the first time, included as a key component of how we understand homelessness uh, and what kinds of interventions are working at both the national and community levels. That is, we structured ESG's components and activities in a way that will streamline reporting to support coordinated and effective reporting and data collection and will, <clears throat> and will allow for performance measurement and program evaluation. Next slide, please. We're going to use a variety of terms today when we're discussing the rules that were released earlier this week. And we want to just be clear about what we're talking about so everybody understands what status each of the rules are in. So let me review some, some of the words that we're going to use, some of the terminology. First is a proposed rule. A proposed rule means that the regulation is published for public comment for 60 days. It is not in effect. After the public comment process ends, the department compiles all of the comments, makes necessary changes, and publishes the rule as final or for effect. Until the regulation is published as final, it does not apply to recipients of funds. And one of the examples of a rule that's going to be in proposed status will be the release of the Homeless Management Information Systems Rule. An interim rule allows the department to publish a rule for effect without first going through the public comment process. The rule is published. Recipients must follow the rule as it is published, but the department still seeks public comment for 60 days. Then at that point, the department compiles the comment, makes the necessary changes, and publishes the rule as final, um, and then the new rule will be published for effect. A final rule is a regulation that is published for effect. It has already gone through the public comment process. Once it is published, recipients must follow the regulation, and there is no additional time period for public comment. Let's go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are four interrelated rules that you are going to have to pay attention to as you implement the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. And here is a simple chart for you to take a look at, at the status of each of those rules. The first is the definition of homelessness. It was published as a proposed rule in April of 2010 and was posted earlier this week in final form. Uh, which means that it is a final rule that has already gone through the public comment process. Both the Emergency Solutions Grants Program and the corresponding amendments to the Consolidated Plan Regulations were posted earlier this week as interim rules, which means that they will be for effect. Uh, they will be in effect 30 days after they are published in the Federal Register, which we expect to be within the next few days and it will be open for public comment for 60 days. 
The fourth rule you have to pay attention to is the Homeless Management Information Systems, or HMIS, rule. We expect that rule to be published within the next couple of weeks as a proposed rule that, again, will be open for public comment with, for 60 days. Next slide, please. So now that you know the status of the rules related to ESG, let's discuss funding just for a moment. The 2011 Appropriations Act directed HUD to spend at least $225 million on the Emergency Solutions Grants Program in fiscal year 2011, which was up from the $160 million that HUD allocated to the Emergency Shelter Grants Program in FY 2010. HUD has decided to allocate a total of $250 million in FY 2011 funds to the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. That is a $90 million or 56% increase over what was allocated in 2010. HUD is implementing the FY 2011 ESG program, as you all know, in two stages or allocations, as illustrated in the chart on this slide. The first allocation of $160 million uh, was already allocated earlier in the year under the Emergency Shelter Grants Regulation because we felt that it was important to make sure that uh, programs that were already started had funding uh, to, to continue. So these funds, the $160 million that was released earlier in the year, will continue to follow the old emergency shelter grants regulation. The additional $90 million in FY 2011 funds will be allocated subject to the new emergency solutions grant program interim regulation. You can find the allocations on HUD's website at www.hudhre.info, which is the Homelessness Resource Exchange, uh, under what's new, the allocations, the second allocations for FY 2011 or the $90 million are listed on that site. Next slide, please. But before you can spend the second FY 2011 allocation, you will have to complete and have approved a substantial amendment to your consolidated plan that defines what you intend to use the new funding for under the new regulations. We will be releasing guidance on the substantial amendment process uh, and those requirements in the coming days, and I believe we have another webinar uh, scheduled on that particular topic. That will also include uh, recipients who decide to reprogram funds from the first allocation of 2011 into uh, the new program rules. But again, we will be giving you further guidance on that in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. This slide, this slide is really a visual on how funds uh, will be spent with the FY 2011 allocation. As indicated in the preamble to the Emergency Solutions Grant Program Regulation, HUD expects that the $90 million second allocation will be spent on new eligible activities, which are homelessness prevention, rapid rehousing, uh, HMIS, and related administrative costs. As you make decisions locally on how these funds are going to be spent, I would urge you to review the rule in detail and understand the new statutory caps, some of which Mike Roanhouse will review later on in this presentation. There may be a few rare instances where the math for the caps for your particular grantee area does not seem to sync up with the chart on this slide. If you think that this is the case for your area, please call your field office or submit a question to the help desk on the Homelessness Resource Exchange so we can advise you directly. Next slide, please. The new ESG program is a permanent program. It is not like the Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program which we knew was a temporary three-year infusion of dollars. So to the best extent that we can, we are not going to be doing what we were calling in HPRP was, you know, flying the plane while we were building it. So what that means is from our perspective here at HUD, we have been working very closely and, and you know, putting a lot of effort into uh, developing formal resources uh, with our technical assistance providers. And those resources are going to be detailed a little bit later in the presentation. But it doesn't just depend on us 
in terms of successful implementation. Successful implementation really also depends on you. We need you to make sure that as you move forward, you are really understanding the new regulations, uh, that you're designing your programs based on what you learned in your emergency shelter grants program, as well as in your homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing program. And I think that it's important to mention here that in these times of incredibly tight resources, it is, in, it is imperative that you all make sure that you are working together with your continuum of care and that all of these resources are being maximized. So we're asking that you cultivate effective collaboration between the ESG recipients and the continuum of care in your area. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Roanhouse to continue the presentation. Thank you, Anne. In this part of the presentation, we are going to cover the first objective, making sure that you understand the ESG program's components and the activities that are eligible under each component. ESG consists of five components, plus administrative costs. The street outreach component provides essential services needed to reach out to unsheltered homeless people and to get them connected to shelter and needed services. The emergency shelter pro component provides essential services to people in emergency shelters and supports renovation and operation of emergency shelters. The homeless prevention component provides services to keep people from becoming homeless and having to live in an emergency shelter or on the streets. The rapid rehousing component provide services to help people who are homeless move quickly into permanent housing and achieve housing stability. The Homeless Management Information System component pays for the cost of operating and contributing to the COC's Homeless Management Information System. Administration is not one of the five components but 7.5% of ESG funds can be used for administrative activities. As you conceptualize your program, you need to think carefully about working within these components. The rest of the slides in this section of the webinar will walk you through a high-level look at the activities that can be undertaken under each component. As we go through these, keep in mind that future webinars, as well as documents and tools on, on the HRE, will provide you with much detail. Next slide. Why components? Before we go into specifics about allowable activities under each component, it is important for you to understand why the program is structured around components in the first place. The HEARTH Act establishes the requirements that continuums of care report on the performance of ESG-funded projects within their geographical area. Components allow for tracking and reporting on the uses of ESG funds against program objectives. Also, organizing the eligible activities in this way also promotes consistency with other homeless assistance programs. HUD has aligned the components, where possible, with those in the Community Continuum of Care program to assist communities with streamlining reporting requirements and identifying consistent performance measures for like projects. HUD also anticipates that these requirements will be consistent with the Rural Housing Stability Assistance Program. Next slide, street outreach. The easiest way to think about the components is that they are organized by population being served. The first component is street outreach. Just like with the Emergency Shelter Grants Program, it is an activity for providing essential services to the unsheltered homeless population. The allowable activities shown on the slide are more defined in the regulation and are more defined than they were under the Emergency Shelter Grants program in terms of what is allowable and what is not. Next slide. 
Next is the emergency shelter component to assist people who are in emergency shelters. This component includes essential services, which are similar to those under the street outreach component, but different in key ways. On the next slide, we're going to get into a comparison. The emergency shelter component also includes shelter activities dealing with renovation, major rehab, conversion, and shelter operations. While these are familiar activities, they are grouped together differently than they were under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program. So we have to change the way we think about them in terms of these component types. Next slide. Both of the first two components, street outreach and emergency shelter, provide essential services to people who are homeless. The key difference between these two components pertains to the population that can be served. The street outreach component includes services targeted to homeless persons staying on the street. The emergency shelter component includes services targeted to homeless persons staying in shelters. The essential services permitted under each component are targeted to the needs of these different groups. As you can see in the side-by-side -side comparison, some activities seem similar under the two programs, but there are key differences. For example, the term case management is used for both components, but the specific activities allowable under case management are different for the two groups. The street outreach case management activities are designed to meet the emergency needs of those who are literally homeless and link them with shelter and services. The emergency shelter case management activities are geared towards the somewhat longer term needs of people who are sheltered with a focus on providing the support those people need to move to permanent housing situations. Also, health and mental health services are allowable under both components, but for street outreach, these services must be of an emergency nature. Trans trans transportation activities are allowable for both components, but only linked with other activities allowed under the component. That is, you can only provide transportation to and from another eligible service. But the grantee does not have to be funding that service. This is included to prevent the abuse of the transportation subsidy. For services for special projects, they can receive the same activities as everyone else. The reason it is called out in the regulation is to indicate that recipients can target services to these special populations. Lastly, engagement is only an eligible activity under street outreach. Next slide. Okay, here's where things get really interesting. Under the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, the amount of funds the grantee or recipient can spend on street outreach or emergency shelter activities is capped. To say it again, the amount of funds from every fiscal year grant that a grantee spends on these two activities together is limited at the greater of 60% of that fiscal year grant amount or the amount of the fiscal year 2010 grant funds committed to street outreach and emergency shelter activities. We understand that you may have questions about this and we'll be providing more information about this in upcoming guidance. Now over to Laura for a poll test. Great, thank you, Mike. Okay, time to hear from all of you. Let's look at the first poll. Essential services for the street outreach and emergency shelter components are identical to ensure consistency across components. True or false? Take a moment, please, and vote.
over 50% of you have already voted. That's great. We'll wait a few seconds more for a few more votes. Okay, essential services for the street outreach and emergency shelter components are identical to ensure consistency across components. You all are correct. That is false. Essential services for the street outreach and emergency shelter components are not identical. This is important to keep in mind as you conduct activities around these two components. Okay, let's look at the second poll. Emergency shelter funds cannot be used to both renovate and operate emergency shelters. True or false? Take a moment and cast your vote. Emergency shelter funds cannot be used to both renovate and operate emergency shelters. True or false? You are correct. It is false. Emergency shelter renovation and operation are both eligible under the emergency shelter component. Okay, now back to Susan Ziff. Thanks, Laura. So we're going to talk about homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing here for a minute. The homelessness prevention component of ESG looks very similar to the homelessness prevention activity under HPRP, but it's very different from homelessness prevention under the emergency shelter grants program. Emergency shelter grants had a much less defined set of eligible activities and a different set of eligibility criteria. Many of the activities eligible under emergency shelter remain eligible under emergency solutions through the housing relocation and stabilization services activities, which we'll talk about. But these include security deposits, legal services, mediation, etc. And those are the services. One major difference between emergency shelter and emergency solutions is that mortgage assistance is not eligible under the new ESG program. Homelessness prevention assistance is available to persons who are either homeless or defined as at risk of homelessness. To be eligible, each individual or family must have an income of less than 30% of the area median income. We're not going to be able to get into detail today about eligibility and what it means to be at risk of becoming homeless. Um, you also may notice that homeless, being homeless is on the prevention slide. Um, there are reasons for that, but unfortunately we don't have time to get into that either. We do have a webinar planned for early December on the homeless definition, and that is going to get into the detail. Also, um, we recommend that you read the, the regulations that were just published. That's going to give you a lot of answers. Um, the eligible, eligible activities for prevention under ESG are similar to, to HPRP, short and medium rental, short and medium term rental assistance, and housing relocation and stabilization services. As we review the specifics of housing relocation and stabilization services and rental assistance, we're going to review some of the major differences between HPRP and ESG. And as I'll reiterate what Anne said earlier, we did learn a lot from HPRP, from your experiences, from the questions that you asked us. Um, and we've included as much as we can, and we want to be as clear as possible. Next slide, please. Rapid rehousing is for persons who are literally homeless, just the same with HPRP. That is, they're on the streets, in emergency shelters, or living in their car or another place not fit for human habitation. Rapid rehousing is intended to help people regain housing and achieve stability. In contrast, Homelessness prevention is for people who are precariously housed and is meant to prevent homelessness and help, um, help individuals and families regain that stability as well. Unlike HPRP, Emergency Solutions Grants um, requires that homeless participants, sorry, that program participants assisted with rapid rehousing, so if they're homeless, are reassessed annually instead of once every three months. 
So I know a lot of you are going to be very happy to hear that. Next slide, please. So as we just saw, both the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing components have the same eligible activities, services and rental assistance, as you can see uh, on that slide, uh, on the prior slide. For housing relocation and stabilization services, these activities include a variety of financial assistance and services. Note that this includes um, financial, uh, financial assistance activities that are anything other than rent. So security deposits, utility deposits, and utility payments, along with moving costs, are all considered housing relocation and stabilization services. So some of you, like me, may be used to the way it was under HPRP, so this organization is going to take some getting used to, but it's that way in the statute um, and the regs, so that's why um, in the law they, they included short and medium term rental assistance under its own category. One similarity with HPRP is that ESG funds cannot be used to provide rent or financial assistance for the same time period and purpose that this assistance is provided by another public source. This is similar to the cost type rule that you might be familiar with for HPRP. Next slide, please. The regulation provides a lot of detail about the provisions surrounding rental assistance under ESG. Again, this training is only meant to provide an overview, so we're just going to hit some highlights. As you can see, rental assistance is available for up to three months which is short term, or from four to 24 months, which is medium term rental assistance. Again, there's another change from HPRP where medium term rental assistance was only allowed for up to 18 months. This change was made to make the length of rental assistance provided under ESG consistent with the upcoming continuum of care program rule where the length of rental assistance in transitional housing can be up to 24 months. So they're going to be similar lengths of assistance. Uh, short and medium term rental assistance can also be for tenant-based assistance or project-based assistance. So if you're, if you're going to be using rental assistance for project-based, those rules are very specific. So you want to make sure that you read the regulation very carefully around that topic. Next slide, please. Rental assistance must be used for permanent housing that meet certain standards. So again, this is all familiar to you if you've been using, um, if you've been working on HPRP. First of all, rent must be within the fair market rent limits and must meet the rent reasonableness standards. So yes, they have to meet both of those standards, you heard correctly. This is done because in certain areas, a rent could be below the FMR, but still not be reasonable when you consider the neighborhood, the type of unit, the amenities, et cetera. Second, all housing must meet the minimum habitability standards that are laid out in the regulations. So again, make sure to read that. There are some changes from what it was under HPRP, so make sure you know those. And third, in order to provide rental assistance, there must be a lease in place between the owner or an agent of the owner, like a property manager, and the tenant. And there also has to be a rental assistance agreement between the organization providing the assistance and the owner or the agent. Again, that's a new piece that you want to make sure you're familiar with. And then the last bullet on this slide is the same as I, I just mentioned, where households can't receive ESG rental assistance if they're already receiving rental assistance for another um, from another subsidy program for the same time period, except for arrears. And with that, I think we're on to our next poll. Laura? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Susan. I think we might be having a technical... Oh, Laura? Yeah, I'm here, Susan. I apologize. I was on mute. Okay. I was having a little bit of a cough, and I didn't want to do that with the whole group here. Okay, here we go. Both, both homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing provide parental assistance and relocation stabilization services. True or false? 
please vote. Okay, about 70% of you have voted. Both homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing provide for rental assistance and relocation stabilization services. True or false? True. Great. 86% came back as true. Rental assistance and housing relocation and stability activities are eligible activities under both the homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing components. The difference between the two components is whether they serve clients who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Okay, let's go to our second poll. Rapid rehousing assistance is appropriate for those at risk of becoming homeless. True or false? Rapid rehousing assistance is appropriate for those at risk of becoming homeless. True or false? Seventy-six of you said false, and that is correct. Only someone who is literally homeless can receive rapid rehousing assistance. Okay, now back to Mike. Thank you. Our last component involves data entry into and management of the Homelessness Management Information System. Homelessness Management Information System lead agencies can use funds to support a range of costs related to operating an effective system. These include hosting and maintaining software or data, backing up, recovering, or repairing software or data, upgrading, customizing, and enhancing the system, integrating and warehousing data, and additional costs are, next slide, administration, reporting, and conducting training. Next slide. For recipients and subrecipients, ESG funds can be used for a range of costs related to contributing data to the system or a comparable database. These eligible activities are shown on this slide and the next, and they include computer hardware, software, and software licenses, office space, utilities, and equipment, obtaining technical support, salaries for systems operation. Additional costs, next slide, are staff travel for training and program participant intake and participation fees charged by the HIMS lead. Remember if the HIMS charges fees to an organization to participate, they are eligible. But of course the HMIS lead agency cannot pay participation fees to itself. Finally, since states cannot retain funds to spend directly on HMIS, these costs do not apply to the state who is a recipient of funds from HUD. Next slide. Moving on to administrative activities. Although administrative activities are not a component of the ESG program, they are necessary to assure effective implementation of other components. And these include providing management, oversight, and coordination, monitoring programs and evaluating performance, training on ESG requirements, preparing ESG and homelessness-related sections of the consolidated plan, and carrying out environmental review responsibilities. State recipients, next slide. State recipients must share a reasonable amount of funds for administrative costs with subrecipients that are units of general purpose local government. Costs that are directly attributable to one of the program components are not subject to the administrative cost limit. This is like HPRP. 
For example, salary costs for a case manager in an emergency shelter may be charged to the essential services line item because they are directly providing housing relocation and stabilization services. However, the, the salary of the executive director who oversees all activities within the agency would be charged to administrative costs. Next slide. Under ESG, up to 7.5% of the grant can be used for administrative costs. In fiscal year 2011, funding has been provided in two allocations. For the first allocation, you have been working under a 5% cap. Because the 7.5 figure will apply to the entire fiscal year 2011 grant, including both allocations, you may will be able to apply that 7.5% amount to the combination of your first and second allocations. IDIS has been configured to allow draws up to 7.5% of the entire 2011 allocation, and it will not allow recipients to draw more than 7.5% for admin. Let's work through this uh, with an example. Next slide. Let's say the total allocation was $175,000. The first allocation was $100,000, and the second is $75,000. We have a three-step process here for calculating the cost. Determine the total amount available for administrative activities. The total fiscal year 2000 allocation is $175,000 for this recipient. In step one, we want to determine how much admin this recipient has to spend. So we take $175,000 and multiply it by 7.5%, and we get $13,125 that is available for admin. The next step is to determine the total amount obligated to administrative activities in the initial allocation. In this step, we figure how much you are eligible to spend on administration for the first allocation by taking 5% of $100,000, which is $5,000. The last step is to determine the total amount available to obligate to administrative activities from the second allocation. We simply subtract the amount of admin in the first allocation from the total allowable, and we thus we get 13,125 minus 5,000, which is 8,125. That's how much of the second allocation the recipient in this example can spend on admin expenses. You can just plug in your community's allocation so you have an understanding of how much admin you can spend. Now we're going to have another poll question. Okay. Let's hear again from you. First poll question. The HMIS component can fund office space, utilities, and equipment needed for HMIS activities. True or false? Please vote. The HMIS component can fund office space, utilities, and equipment needed for HMIS activities. Is this true or false? 86% of you said it's true, and that is correct. Eligible expenses under HMIS include not only computer hardware and software and staff time to do the work, but also costs related to maintaining an office space for HMIS activities. Let's look at our second poll. The amount of funding available for administrative activities has been cut substantially from emergency shelter grants. True? or false.
the amount of funding available for administrative activities has been cut substantially from emergency shelter grants. True or false? False. 89% of you said false, and you are correct. Administrative funding has risen from 5% to 7.5% of the grant amount. OK, now back to Susan. OK, now we're going to talk about ESG program requirements. If you move to the next slide, please. One of the big new program requirements is the requirement to use a centralized or coordinated intake assessment throughout the continuum of care. Um, and that's in order to conduct the initial assessment of every program participant who receives assistance through ESG. This is another one that's going to take some people some planning and some getting used to, um, because we actually know that there's still some disconnect between ESG recipients and some continuums of care in some places, not everywhere. So this requirement does not actually go into effect right now. Uh, it doesn't go into effect until the continuum of care rule is final. And I know the next question is, when is that going to be? But I can't actually tell you when that's going to be, and I don't know. Um, so just know that you have a little bit of time to work on prepping and planning for this to take effect. Where a centralized or coordinated assessment process has already been established, ESG recipients may choose to participate. However, like I said, every COC will be required to establish this, this intake system under the new COC regulations. The statute also requires recipients to implement ESG in collaboration with their COC and as a community. It, this is intended to promote coordination um, because, again, we've seen, especially through our implementation of HPRP, um, sometimes there's, there's not enough collaboration and coordination between the two. So ultimately, the purpose of both of these requirements is to support more strategic targeting of homeless assistance resources in communities, which is also supporting the goals of the federal, federal strategic plan. Next slide, please. There are numerous other program requirements that we don't have time to get into detail about today, but we do want to mention them so that you'll be aware of them and be on the lookout for additional information. ESG is, as it always has been, a part of the consolidated plan process. The con plan regulation was amended to account for HEARTH, and that was also posted two days ago. Communities are going to have to submit a substantial amendment for that fiscal year 2011 second allocation of ESG. And again, more information coming about that. As always, projects and uses of funds must be consistent with the approved consolidated plan. Also, at all points, recipients and subrecipients must be working to connect participants with mainstream resources. This is going to be a key part of ESG. And last on the slide, reevaluation of program participants ensures that limited ESG funds are going to those who need it most. The frequency of reevaluation will depend on the type of service provided. As I, I alluded to this before, but for program participants being served with homelessness prevention assistance, they're required to be reevaluated every three months or before the fourth month of rent is paid. For program participants who are, have been rapidly rehoused, they are required to be reevaluated at least annually. Next slide. Re um, participants, uh, oh, sorry, recipients will be required to have written standards on a wide range of topics. This is one of the common monitoring findings that we had with HPRP. Um, some HPRP grantees didn't have written policies and standards that were written out clearly or communicated clearly to subgrantees. Second, a dollar for dollar match is required, and this can be cash or in kind. There are exceptions for territories and the first $100,000 of state grants, just as there was under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program. Recipients must participate in HMIS, as Mike talked about. They have to use IDIS for draws, and they will be completing performance reporting. So again, more details coming.
but you should know now that in the first year, performance reporting is going to be fairly limited. Once all recipients and subrecipients are using HMIS, the data that you're reporting is going to be expected to come from the HMIS. And on to the next uh, poll question. Thank you. OK, one poll question. Which of the following is not a program requirement? Centralized coordination, HMIS, or HQS? Which of, which of the following is not a program requirement? OK, about 75% of you have voted. Which of the following is not a program requirement? You are correct. HQS is not required. OK, back to Mike about next steps in implementing the ESG program. Thank you. There are four main things to tackle right away. First. Review the new regulations to understand what is possible under the amended ESG program. Second, start planning your program and building relationships between recipients and COCs. Third, recipients need to start the planning process for submitting your substantial amendment to the consolidated plan. Fourth, start thinking about the challenges you're going to face and how you might overcome them. The next few slides identify some of the questions you may want to ask yourselves. Next slide. What can we as a community learn from the experience with the Emergency Shelter Grants Program and from HPRP best practices? What can we learn from the challenges to implementing HPRP? What has HPRP taught us about our community's needs? How can ESG address those needs? Next slide. How will we consult and coordinate with COCs? How will we ensure satisfactory HMIS participation by ESG recipients, subrecipients? And how will we address unsatisfactory levels of HMIS participation? In conclusion, and on a lighter note, we know this has been a long, long wait. During this period, uh, many of you probably thought about the great lyrics sung by the immortal Grady, Gracie Slick, lead singer for Jefferson Airplane. Don't you want some ESG hearth regs to love? Don't you need some ESG hearth regs to love? Wouldn't you love some ESG regs to love? Darn it, HUD, when are you going to get us some ESG regs to love? We sincerely hope that we have published interim ESG regs that you can and will love. And let us know whether that is a mad, passionate love at first sight. Then again, maybe it'll be a quickie divorce. Anne, over to you to conclude. Thank you, Mike, for that moment of levity. I think we all need it. Um, we actually are getting some questions in the help desk about why you didn't sing. So <laughs> next time, everybody wants to hear you sing it. Uh, this is Anne Oliva again, and just before we, we uh, send it back over to our moderator, I wanted to take a moment to uh, thank you all for your patience. I know that this has been a long road, and both for us as well as for you, and frankly, we're relieved to have the first three sets of regulations available for you all to, to look at and implement. I also want to encourage all of our providers out there to look closely at the ESG con plan and HMIS regulations when they are released for public comment uh, on the Federal Register. 
we take the comments that you provide us very seriously, and you can actually see how seriously we take them when you read the definition of homelessness final rule. In the preamble, we actually address every single public comment that came in and uh, explain why or why we took the comment or why we chose not to take um, the suggestion that was made in any specific comment. So you can see that we take your feedback seriously and we encourage you to uh, submit thoughtful and constructive comments uh, during the public comment period. Uh, earlier this week, many of you know that the fiscal year 2012 budget for the Department of Housing and Urban Development was passed by Congress. I will be sending something out, as I do uh, about once or twice a year, from me on the listserv. So if you're not a member of uh, the Continuum of Care, the ESG, or the HPRP listserv, I would suggest that you, that you join. Uh, and it will update you on what our plans are for rolling out the rest of the HEARTH Act program given some of the budget constraints that we are necessarily going to have um, in fiscal year 2012. So again, with that, I want to thank you all again for your participation today and your patience. And I'm going to turn it back over to Laura for the final quiz. OK, great. Thank you, Ann. All right, final quiz. You should begin planning immediately for, for substantial amendments to the con plan. True or false? You should begin in planning immediately for substantial amendments to the con plan. True or false? True. Ninety-five percent of you said true, and that is exactly right. Yes, you can, and you should begin planning now. So let me say a few things about resources. Um, all of these upcoming webinars will be posted in the calendar on the HRE for convenient access for all of you. Uh, HUD will also be sending out listservs to announce each of the webinars with a link for easy registration. Next slide, please. In addition, HUD is working to produce a number of user guides highlighting key changes in the new regulation and will alert communities when these anticipated resources become available. Next slide, please. In addition to the user guides, we anticipate that the HRE will provide a range of additional resources, and communities will be alerted when these resources become available. Next slide, please. So during this webinar, we've gone through ESG components and the activities that can be undertaken for each component. We've also discussed the major program requirements you will need to take into account. We've discussed the types of resources that are available now or will be available soon on the HRE and have introduced you to the ESG Help Desk. So you should have good access to the resources you need to learn more about the topics that were presented and discussed today. Finally, we ended the discussion with a list of questions that you should begin thinking about to get ESG implementation underway locally as soon as possible. We hope that the materials here have provided these key pieces of information and that you're ready to learn more about many of the topics touched on here through our upcoming webinars and through the materials to be posted soon on the HRE. We ask that you take a few minutes to complete the online survey that will be coming to you uh, via the email address that you use to register for this webinar, and that will show up in your mailbox within the next hour. Next slide, please. Um, I want to thank today our presenters, Ann Oliva, Mike Rowenhaus, and Susan Ziff for the presentation, and also thank Brett Gagnon and Teresa Silva for answering all of your questions. As a reminder, if you have additional questions, please submit them through the virtual help desk on the home page of the HRE. You can select Emergency Solutions Grant, and then select the appropriate subtopic underneath that for your question. Next slide, please. The PowerPoint for this uh, webinar can be found under the tab resource on the HRE homepage. Um, 
and you can uh, also the recording form from this webinar will be posted uh, by November 28th on the HUD HRE website. You can also obtain information or assistance from the HRE at any time by searching the website and the library, using the ask a question function, or requesting technical assistance. Um, so please join us next week on Tuesday for an overview of the consolidated plan and preparations for substantial amendments at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time here at Ready, Set, Go webinar. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.